Well, good morning. Hey, it's good to be with you guys this morning. Hey, let's stand together. I mean, if you could, if, if you guys have any, any room uh, with the seats next to you, if you could kind of make your way to the outside of the aisle, uh, that'd be super helpful as people continue to filter in. We'll make, uh, make a little bit of room for others as they're, they're coming in this morning. <clears throat> hey, welcome to River Valley Church. If you are new with us this morning, uh, we're really glad that you've joined us. Um, I know it's a, it's a risk to come to church for the first time, a new place for the first time. And uh, if that's you this morning, we're really glad that you, you took that risk and you came in and joined us uh, for worship. Um, before we begin this morning, uh, let's, uh, let's go before the, wor- the Lord in prayer uh, and ask his blessing over our time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for this morning. We thank you for the gathering um, of this body of believers, uh, both here in this room, um, but also uh, online. And so we, we thank you, Lord, that wherever we're at this morning, um, we have an opportunity uh, to lift up praises, to lift up worship to you this morning. Uh, and Lord, that this, this morning, this one hour of our time right now is, is simply just one act of worship out of many uh, that we get to participate in this week. And so God, as, as we gather together corporately uh, for this next hour, God, may you be honored. May you uh, receive praise this morning. God, we sing songs of worship to you and for you because of you. Uh, but Lord, as, as one big choir in this place, we also sing songs over one another. And so Lord, I just pray and ask that there would be encouragement found here today. I pray and ask that your spirit would, uh, would bring conviction, would bring challenge, would bring counsel, comfort, and healing. So Father, we just bring, we bring our whole self to you this morning. Whether we're down and broken, struggling, whatever it is, or whether we're doing awesome, we just bring it all to you this morning. And we thank you that we have a God that meets us exactly where we're at. So God, we give you worship this morning because you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start with a chorus this morning. This whole song talks about uh, the dead being made new, the dead being Uh, made alive and so we start with this you called my name I ran out of that grave
Romans chapter 2, Paul says this, and you were dead in the trespasses and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. And then later on in verse 4, he says, but God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And that's what we're singing about this morning. We're singing about his grace that has saved us, that has brought us from death to life. We sing these words, I needed rescue.
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who weeps. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Thank you this morning, God, that you took our place. God, that you offered up yourself. You offered up your only son to satisfy the wrath of a holy God because of our sin. And we, we just thank you for it this morning. We remember this morning and we're about to move into a time of, of celebrating communion. And Lord, this this song kind of tees up communion to a certain degree of, of recognizing that you suffered on our behalf. And it wasn't just the physical suffering, but it was the suffering of, of bearing the weight of the very wrath of God upon you. And so we just thank you for it this morning. God, we will never stop thanking you for it. And so God, we are here this morning with hearts that are grateful, hearts that are full of gratitude over your great mercy, over your great love. We just simply say thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite Joel and Laura Ehrlich up, and they're going to lead us in communion this morning. Thanks, guys. Good morning. It's a privilege to be able to be here with you this morning and celebrate communion. One quick note, if you did not get a, a cup and the bread, if you would just put up your hands, the ushers will be passing some of those out. Um, at Rivie, River Valley Church here, we are a body of believers, and we believe to celebrate communion, you just need to know the Lord as your Savior. You don't have to be a member. If you have never made that commitment to trust Jesus, we ask that you refrain from taking the cup. But we do pray that as you are in the midst of this uh, time, that the Holy Spirit would work in your heart. And as the song that we just sang said, we pray that he would call your name and that you would run out of that grave. So Jesus was not only a first century Jewish man, he was an observant Jewish man. He kept the law perfectly. Um, he was dedicated in the temple on the eighth day, and he would have gone up to Jerusalem for all of the pilgrim feasts annually since he was a kid. He was an adult, um, and he would have fulfilled the law in Exodus 12, <clears throat> Exodus 12 24. <laughs> Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped, and the Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So on this final Passover that Jesus was about to celebrate with his disciples, he knew this year was going to be different, and um, he knew that all the other Passovers had just been a foreshadow of what he was going to do. Uh, he was going to give himself as the perfect lamb and the perfect sacrifice. Luke twenty two fourteen says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said, the, said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So Jesus was excited to eat this Passover with his disciples because he knew that he would be shortly fulfilling it. So taking communion is a wonderful time of celebration that we celebrate the Lord's death. But Paul also tells the Corinthians to not do it flippantly. 
Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. So I'm going to give us a, a minute or so here. If you want to close your eyes or whatever, just take some time to um, look at your heart, um, look at your relationships. Is there any hidden thing that you need to confess before the Lord before we take this together? So we'll take a minute or so of silence. Father God, we thank you today. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for our sins and allow us the ability to, Lord, to know you and to walk with you. In Jesus' name. Paul recounts uh, the words of the Lord from the Gospels, the words that were given to him. Um, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night was he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, he probably used the traditional blessing over the bread. He would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Likewise, when he took the cup, he probably would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. What he said next was a change, something his disciples would not have been expecting. Jesus was instituting a new covenant. So at this time, if you would hold the bread. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread as we remember Jesus' sacrifice. And now if you would hold the cup. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink the cup as we remember the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Just close this in prayer. So Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving your life and living a perfect life that we could never do. We could never be that payment for our sin. And you came and satisfied the law perfectly. And thank you that we are covered in your blood and your righteousness. And now we are washed white as snow. Thank you for opening the doors for us to have even a clean conscience before you, Lord, knowing that you have paid for every sin fully and completely. And now you wash us in white robes and welcome us to be your children. So thank you, Father, for the awesome work 
that you've done. And Lord, we just, we pause and remember the price that you had to pay, Lord, by being, being crucified on the cross for us, for our sins. So Lord, we thank you and we trust in your finished work. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can pass your cups to the outside for the ushers, that'd be great. There's a reminder that on Communion Sunday, we also have care offering. So as you exit the double doors, you'll see the mission board. Um, you can place your extra care offering there. Also, if you're new this morning visiting and want more information on River Valley Church, the information booth is outside to the left as well. Uh, this sheet here, if you did not get one when you came in, make sure you grab one on the way out. It has a plethora of information on it of the happenings of River Valley Church, announcements, and the one I want to highlight uh, today, actually, is next Saturday, the rummage sale. Um, please um, take note of that and help out where you can and come if you can. Um, I'm not sure if you saw, but as you turn the corner, you saw something a little fishy. Um, yep, there's a pun. There's more to come. Uh, so we're looking to cast a vision through the month of May. And in casting a vision, we're asking you to get on deck to help serve in the kids area. Um, serving is a blessing. It's not a have to, it's a get to. Um, so I'm inviting you to come jump into the River Valley Kids Ministry. Um, and to do that, when you exit, go down the steps, you'll see the plethora of fish. Plethora is my word for the day, if you have not noticed. Um, there will be a plethora of fish on the windows and on the wall. Don't be overwhelmed. Each fish rep represents a position that needs filled over the next four months. So when you get on deck to serve, you're deciding to say, hey, Tracy, I'm deciding to serve for June, July, August, and September. I'm choosing to serve every week or every other week or once a month, preferably more than that, but we'll take you if it's once a month. Um, and when you see what position you want, what month what you want, and what age you want, you'll pull that fish off the window. And if that seems so overwhelming to you, you don't know how to do that, that's okay. We're here to help. There's blank fish in the basket. Make sure your name's on the blank fish. Drop it in the little fish mock aquarium there. And then I'll connect with you through the week. So I look forward to getting to know you as you decide to serve the kids' ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Really quickly, I would like to find out how many college students are here this morning. Could you just raise your hand if you're a UWO college student, or any college student, doesn't have a UWO, but great. Um, I'm gonna have you stand in a minute. I'm gonna tell you why though, okay? Um, first of all, I just wanna tell you, we so greatly appreciate having college students here. Uh, I love the idea and the fact that you have made a decision to come and be a part of a church even though you're in college. Uh, we all know that you could go to Pastor Springs Church or Pastor Sheets Church. A lot of people stay at those. But um, you guys have come here to a body. And we're really glad that you have done that. So uh, I know finals are coming up. Before long, you'll be looking for summer jobs, maybe even heading out for the summer, and we'll miss you. So if you're a, UWO, you're, if you're a college student, any college student, UWO or others, if you just stand right now, I'm just going to pray for you. So I just want you to know how much we appreciate you. And many of you serve in our ministries. I've been so amazed at how many of you have just jumped in and served in lots of places. So thank you for standing, and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I know that we're heading into finals here, and uh, as that happens, Lord, I would pray for each of these students that you would give them great recall of the things they've learned, help them to be able to study well, to be able to prepare for that, and then bless the time that they have to take those exams. Father, many of them are going to be looking for jobs. Some of them have found them, some haven't. And Lord, where they're looking for a job, I pray that you'd open a door for them so they can find that job for the summer. Uh, I thank you for each one of their lives. I pray and ask, Lord, that you'd strengthen them, encourage them. I pray they'd even grow spiritually in the summer while they're away. And then, Lord, we just pray that you would just watch over them and help them to come back. And we just thank you so much for their ministry, for their life, for their attendance here. And we just give you praise for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks. I really, we really appreciate you. So. <clears throat> it, it really is neat. Okay. Um, there are a couple things. Bibles are available to you. If you don't have a Bible, we want you to have one. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be finishing up 
chapter 2 of Philippians, so just get their attention. They'll be glad to give you a Bible uh, for the morning. And then uh, the other thing is there's a friendship pad. We always say this. I know it gets old, but anyway, there's a friendship pad somewhere in your row. Uh, please take it, fill it out, pass it down, and be sure to write your prayer request because we like to pray for you. So if you do that for us, we really appreciate it. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. So let me just tell you a story as we get started here. Um, there was a lady in a traffic light. There was one car ahead of her. Um, she pulled up. The car parked and started in front of her. The red light's red. Uh, his head's down. So you know what that means, right? Uh, you, we see people with their head down a lot in cars these days. And so the light turns green, and she does what most people do. She just kind of hit the horn a little beep, you know, just say, hey, hey the light's green. Nothing happened, didn't raise his head, car didn't budge. Uh, so she did what most people do at that point, then you hit the horn a little harder, right? So you gave a pretty solid toot to it and uh, let him know that the light was green. Um, nothing happened, he didn't move at all. Um, and so now the light's just about to change. Uh, he looks up, sees the yellow, shoots through the light, and she's stuck there for another cycle of the light which kind of overwhelms her. If you can imagine at that moment, kind of a little overwhelmed. Uh, so she laid on the horn, she stuck her arm out the window, gave some hand signals, and shouted some unkind words. A few seconds later, there's a little knock on the window, and it's a police officer. And the officer says, man, would you step out of your car? And he, she steps out, and he puts her in cuffs, takes her back, puts her in his cruiser, and gets on the radio. Uh, it only takes about a minute or two, and then he turns around and says, ma'am, I'm really sorry. He takes the cuffs off. Uh, sorry for the misunderstanding. He goes, but I hope you understand. I, I saw your car. I saw the fish on the back. I saw the, what would Jesus do, bumper sticker, and then the follow me to Sunday school license plate tag, and, and I thought the car had been stolen. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get the point, right? <laughs> Sometimes what we say doesn't line up with what we do. And that's kind of the point in the text today that we're going to study, uh, Paul is calling us to be light in a dark world. Um, that's the call, and he's going to call us to that. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, if you want to make your way there, it's verse 14 is where we're going to start. We'll pick up some things we looked at last week. Paul says that we are to shine as lights in this world, and apparently the way you do that is by being in the world but being very different from it by not being like it. He starts off by saying you shouldn't be filled with grumbling and disputing, a common thing that happens in life. But we aren't to have that. As a matter of fact, Jesus prayed this prayer, and Paul gets it from Jesus' teaching, I'm sure, when he prayed in John 17. That's the pastoral prayer that, that Jesus prays for the disciples and for us, looking down the line. Here's what he says in John 17. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of this world. Do you know when we become believers in Jesus Christ, when we put our trust in him, we change allegiances we switch from the world to heaven. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, the text says, the scripture says, that we become citizens of heaven. Now, my passport says that I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I'm happy to have that passport. But in actuality, biblically, I am a citizen of heaven. If you look over a chapter in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So Paul is going to call us to be a light in a dark place. Let's read the text this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 to the end. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 
likewise you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interest and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself may come to. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, and your messenger and your minister to my needs. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager then to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And so here we have the reading of God's word. If we are citizens of heaven, well, that means our allegiance changes from men to God. It means that God is large and people get smaller. And fortunately, in our lives, it's often true that people are big and God's small. And that's the way we see things. It may sound silly to you, but why do people buy stuff that they can't afford? Why do they lie to save face? Why don't we speak up more against evils and wrongs? Why are we agreeing with things we find absurd? The list could go on and on. And one of the things that happens to us is that many of us are fearful of what someone will think of us. When people are big and God is small, then we face continual defeat in our lives. God is large. He's huge. Even true worshipers of Christ, true followers, the Bible calls it the fear of men. We have that. The fear, fear is a, an interesting word. It's bigger than just being afraid. It includes uh, being in awe of holding someone to high esteem. It, it includes even being, being mastered by them. And when we allow people to master us, it's called idolatry. When we put people ahead of God, it's called idolatry. It's been around for a long time. You know, we always like to rename things so that they're easier on us. So for teenagers, we call the fear of men peer pressure. All peer pressure is, is people being afraid of what their friends will think. It's the fear of men. For adults, we have another name for it. We call the fear of men people pleasing. We're just trying to please all the people around us so that we can make them all happy. We are pleasing men and not God. We even have psychological terms for it. We call it codependency where I'm literally in a connection or relationship where I have to somehow please them, and often they're unpleasable, but that's an interesting point. So the fear of man is a universal problem, and we are called, as followers of Jesus Christ, to fear God as the beginning of wisdom. And so here's the picture. Part of being light in the world is is being uh, different than the world. Part of being light in the world means shining bright in dark places. And Paul is calling us to that. Uh, When people are big and God is small, then then we work more at blending in than being light. Uh, This is a picture that we all battle. We are to live in this world, but not to be like it. We, We are to hold fast to the truths of God's word, even when it's inconvenient. And we are to shine brightly and distinctly in a dark and lost world. So I wanna talk about two things. I wanna talk about where to shine and how to shine. Where to shine and how to shine from the text we have this morning. So we'll start with verse two, chapter two, verse 15. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So we know where we're supposed to shine We are supposed to shine in the dark. That makes sense, right? I mean, think about it. Let's say you're on a beach. Um, It is a bright, sunny day, blue sky. You're catching rays, and somebody comes walking by with a flashlight. You'd be like, that dude's weird, right? At the very least, you'd say, that's worthless. 
And yet, there are many Christians who the only place they ever let their light shine is among Christians. That's not what we were called to. We were called to shine our light in dark places. Uh, We are called to be not like the world. Let me read again verse 15. Children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So we are to be lights in the world in a crooked and twisted place. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I don't know that I'm enough light. You are enough light if you know Christ. When I was a kid, we went to Old Man's Cave. We took a journey, a guided tour down. We went down into the cave, way down, I don't know how far down, into a place I think they called the cathedral. It was this enormous cavern open up and down, way down deep in the earth. And, and the guide said to us, have you ever experienced total darkness before? I don't think I had, actually. And so as kids, he said, now if you're kids, going to scoot you close to your parents because it's going to get really dark in here. And they turned off all the lights. And then he said, put your hand in front of your face, and you couldn't even see a shadow of your hand in front of your face. And then he took a match, and he lit it. A match this big, flame this big. From that little flame of light, we could see the sides and the ceiling and the floor of that cavern. We could see one another. The the, the light was tiny but so powerful. We are called to be a light. And God doesn't say, you're going to be a big light. He doesn't say that. He's the big light. You and I just need to reflect him. That's all we have to do. And so we reflect his light. So he describes for us two words about where we are to be light. He says we're to be light in a crooked place and a twisted place. Uh, Now, the word crooked in Greek means crooked. Just thought I'd let you know. I mean, sometimes we say, well, the words mean in Greek, and often you forget the fact that most of the words are translated very well. It's just crooked. It means crooked. The word scolia is the Greek word. We get the word scoliosis, which is a person who has a twisted spine. And the picture here is of being, being, being twisted, being crooked, being morally bent, spiritually deformed, and not able to hold the weight of what takes place. So let me talk about being morally bent. The world we live in is morally bent. What do I mean by that? Well, it says in the scripture that there is enough in creation for everybody to know that there is a God who exists. And because of that, no one has an excuse. All are under a condemnation if they don't listen to that. And yet, you and I know people who go, well, I look at creation, I just don't see it. I don't get it. I don't don't see God in that. I'm not sure. And you say, well, what is that? Well, it's because they are bent morally. Here's another text that talks about 2 Corinthians 4.4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So what he's saying is that there are people in the darkness, they're they're bent morally, they're they're blinded morally. I don't know if you know this or not, but when light comes in and exposes darkness, everybody's not excited about that. Did you know that? There are people who are not going to be excited about that particular light, but we're still to be light. They are spiritually deformed. And we were created to be in a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's what we were created for. And, and when we sin, it tears us away from that relationship, and Jesus restores that relationship so that we can go back to, big, again, building that relationship with God. So we have this relationship. One of my friends described life as saying it's like a whole bunch of wells, and we all need a well because we need life. We need that refreshment that comes from a well. We need that healing that comes from a well. We need the, the, the source of life that comes from a well. But the problem is the, the world has made a whole bunch of counterfeit wells. And they're all around us. And there, there's sex and there's power and recreation and finding someone who loves you, even if it's the wrong person, and achievements. And there are all these wells And we're searching for what will bring life into our lives. And people find these wells. The problem is they are always sour at the end. They look good. They offer some cool water, but they're sour. And they don't meet what we need. We need God. We need a relationship with God. We need to be restored to that. And thirdly, there's a a crookedness, and when there's a crookedness in your spine, for instance, it it makes it so you can't hold the weight that you have very well. 
And that is exactly true in the spiritual sense that the crooked world cannot hold up under the weight of what happens to us in this world because it's a crooked place. Listen, there are lots of hard things in life. Have you noticed that? There's death, there's disease, there's discouragement, disappointment, there's evil, there's violence, there's injustice. I mean, we could go on and on. There's loneliness. As a matter of fact, there is no end to the trouble in a world corrupted by fallen people. Do you get that? There will be no end here to the end of corruption in a fallen world where people continually do things that are fallen. If you don't have Christ, if you don't hold fast to the word of life, if you don't know how to drink from the scriptures and take a long drink from that well, if you don't know how to rest in the arms of God when you're in the midst of trouble, if you don't know how to do that, you're going to crumble under the things in this dark world. The world is a system of dark things and people are big in it. But God is not. He is big as well. The second thing he says is we live in a twisted generation. Some translate this a perverse generation. Take physically hurting your body to relieve psychological pain. Maybe you've heard of this. There's a thing called cutting where literally the person cuts their body in order to feel less psychological pain. And then the doctors got involved in it. And so we have facelifts and tummy tucks and augmentations and Botox. And all of them are doing something physically to rely or have a psychological pain. And they are false wells. They are twisted. There's something strange about it. But, but it shouldn't be. Listen, you know this about our world. Our world shouts at the top of their lungs, this is my body, which is not true of those of us who belong to Christ in heaven because my body is not my own, I'm his. We, we have these things, we have to be different than the world, we can't be the same. There are a lot of twisted things. 80 million babies have been aborted in the United States since Roe versus Wade. 80 million. Some people in our culture call that population control. That's twisted. There are twisted things. We live in a twisted world. Every 35 minutes, the FBI tells us there's a murder. Every uh, six minutes, a rape. Every 14 seconds, a burglary. Okay, you've had enough bad news, right? We live in a dark place, a a crooked and a twisted place. And so God calls us to shine in it. So the question is, how do we shine? How do we shine in a world that that has cast off so many of the values that God's given? How do we shine in a world that's against us shining in the world? How do we do it? Well, the first thing is we have to have the attitude of Christ. All of Philippians 2 is about Jesus who leaves heaven, empties himself, pours himself out, And it goes all the way obediently to the cross to die in our place. That's what Philippians is about. And then we're told, have this attitude in yourself, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the attitude we have to have. So if you're going to shine, you've got to have his attitude. Uh, Jesus didn't go like this. He didn't go, well, I tell you, these stupid people are making me so frustrated. I'm just going to have to die for them. He didn't do that. Neither did he say, oh, everything they do is fine. I just love them so much. I'm just going to love them, and it doesn't matter what they do. He didn't do either one of those things. He called them out. He said, listen, go and sin no more. But somehow in the process, he was filled with grace. Jesus never came off condescending, and he's the only one who could. He left heaven. They're his rules. This is his world. He he never came off condemning, but always invites us in, in the process. This is difficult, isn't it? To be humble with people, to invite them in, to be loving and kind, and, and then speak truth that they don't like. This is not an easy thing to do. We are to be lights in the darkness, which means that you'll have to listen to the company orientation telling you how to use personal pronouns and to use them the way people ask you to use them. 
And then you have to figure out how to be light and grace in the middle of that. And that is not simple. And you're going to have to find a way to do it. Let me give you an, an idea, an example. Mark, I will do my best to be your friend. I promise that I will treat you with honor and respect. But Mark, I cannot call you Mary because that would be pretending that God made a mistake and you are not a mistake to God. And you're not a mistake to me either. And I have to call you M from here on. Now listen, I'm not giving you the solution. This is a hard place to be. There are times when the best thing to do is say nothing. But there are times when you and I need to speak with kindness, with gentleness into this world. Nothing we say as a Christian should be said without extreme grace and kindness. Colossians 4, 5 and 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best of use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Do you have a work environment where they swear a lot? <laughs> if you work in a factory, you do, don't you? Yeah, yeah you, you, know those, you know those environments. How, how do you deal with that? Well, maybe you do this. Maybe you say, Joe, you know, I, I wish we didn't have so much swearing in here, and you know, I just want to ask you to swear less around me. I, I just hate the F word, but to be honest with you, the thing that tears me up the most is when you use God's name flippantly, because I believe in God, and I believe we have to be careful not to use his name carelessly. I'm just asking you, just if you could, just try to, try to curb the swearing around me. Do you see what's happening? It's light. As a matter of fact, this is the way we have to live. But let me tell you something you've got to hear from me. I'm not giving you the solution to a tough problem. These are hard issues. It may not go well. You may get fired for not doing the pronouns the way they like them. That's a possibility. You may have friends who swear more just to mock you for asking them not to swear. All those are possibilities. My point is that everything we do must be filled with grace and humility. And it must be like Jesus who said, come with me. I'll walk with you through the whole thing. Come and I'll help you through it. He is light in a dark place. So second part about shining in a dark place is to share the gospel. Look at verse 16 holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud of that I did not run in vain or let you labor in vain. Okay, hold fast to the word of life. You know what the word of life is? What's the word of life? Is it even a word? And if it's a word, what word is it? Is it love? Is it forgiveness? What's the word of life? That's not it. Maybe the word of life is like a general truth statement, like a proverb. Is that what it is? No, that doesn't fit. Oh, I know. The word of life is a creed. It's a song. It's something that we sing like a prayer. Philippians chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11 was, we think, a creed that the early church used. You think it's that? No, I don't think it fits. There are some places that you need to understand where the word does not mean a vocabulary word. Does that make sense? You know this, right? You, you know these verses. Instead of meaning a vocabulary word, it means a being who is the word. A being who communicates God's will to us. Uh, you know the text, John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so now you know that sometimes the word word means Jesus and we are to hold fast to the word of life. We are to hold fast to what Jesus did, who he says he is, what he claimed, what he finished. That's what we're holding on to. We're holding on to the teachings of Jesus because he's the word. We hold on to the word of life, which means we hold on to the gospel. Now, now some translations, King James, for instance, translates this phrase, holding out the word of life, which is a great translation, I mean, a great principle of truth. I don't think it's the best translation of these words. I think it's to hold on to, hold tight to. But in truth, if we hold on to the gospel, guess what? We also hold it out, don't we? I mean, if you really understand the gospel and what Jesus did for you, you want other people to know that. And so in that case, it's probably a decent translation as well. Now, the word of life is Jesus. 
the gospel. It's all that he taught us. The word of life, we hold on to it. It becomes our, our purpose in living is to hold the word of life. It becomes our mission to let people in the light world know the light of Christ. Do, do you understand that the light that's gonna change people from darkness to light is not your kindness, it's not your goodness, it's not all the rules you relaxed? It, it, it's Jesus. When people meet Jesus, he leads them out of darkness. When they made Jesus, he breaks their chains, as we sang earlier. It's also why people are always trying to turn Jesus into just a good teacher. Because if we could just make Jesus a good teacher, then we can do whatever we want and just say, oh, if you want to be a good example, you can follow Jesus. The rest of the time, you do what you want. And that happens a lot. The third thing is pouring out our lives. Philippians 2, 17 says, I, even though I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you. There is no way around it to follow Jesus, to, to be light in a dark place means that you have to be poured out. It just means poured out. Contrary to popular belief, where I want to live my best life now, which is false teaching and preaching, we are called to have our lives poured out like Christ. That we're, we're called to pour our life out in loving people and proclaiming the truth and standing differently, looking different than the world, uh, speaking truth to the world and a whole system that doesn't follow us. And it will take a lot of courage for you to do that. And God's gonna have to be bigger than all the people you know because otherwise you'll panic uh, we are called to pour out our lives. Look at Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. You notice the time frame? Daily and follow me. If you're gonna shine your light in the world, you're gonna have to pour your life out. Which means this is not about how much recreation you have, how early you get to retire, how many toys you have. It's about pouring your life out for God's kingdom Paul uses Timothy as an example. He says that Timothy is one of those great examples. He says, I don't have anybody like Timothy. The phrase means I don't have anyone of a kindred spirit like Timothy. And he explains it. He says, only Timothy will come and be concerned about your interest and about what Jesus wants to do. All the rest, he said, are interested in their own personal interests. I always kind of laugh when people say, we've got to go back to the early church and be like them. Well, they did something right because we're here. That's good. The same token, there's a lot of books written because they had a lot of problems in the early church, just like we do. And Paul couldn't find, he could only find one person he could send to Philippi who would care for them more than himself, and it was Timothy. He, he realists Epaphroditus, who comes from Philippi, bringing a gift of provisions for him while he's in prison. And he says, I'm sending him back to you. He was ill to the very point of death. He almost poured out his whole life just to get me this gift from you. We are called to be lights in a dark world. It's not an easy task. It's not a task that's going to be like, oh, that was really fun. It's going to be a hard task. It's going to require that we proclaim Christ. It's going to require that we, we put on humility. It's going to require that we pour ourselves out for other people. It's costly. But the light comes into the dark, and it pulls people out of the dark. And it pulls them to a life where they can again begin to have a relationship with the creator of the universe, and it begins to flood them with real living water that doesn't sour and that's important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as always, I thank you so much for your word. It, it, it stirs in us. And Lord, I pray for River Valley to have courage. Because we need courage to stop worrying about what people think and simply be yours. Lord, we're going to need resolve to pour ourselves out. We're going to need some clarity to proclaim the gospel well. And oh, Lord, we need a lot of humility because it's not our natural place. And so I ask for those things. And I ask that you would use us for your kingdom, that you would use us to be light to people who are lost, who are in darkness, who are, who are failing or fading. 
I pray and ask that you'd use us in these things. All this we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And amen. God bless you as you go.